wonderful to see you all. And 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 a lot of you, well, um, a lot of you know each other, but uh, some so you don't know everybody in the room. And some of us that like are on staff or something like that, we know we know almost all of you. So um, being in a room like this, I just want to assure you, like you look around and you see individual people that you love, but you also see the work that's like behind them and what they do and and what the Lord has like invited them into in the city. And it's really remarkable to be in a room like this and you can see sort of like the way that the gospel is infusing so many different areas of the city through you, the priesthood of all believers. Um, and so I just think the, these environments where we see each other, we get to swap stories and I just think it's so rich. Um, Every year we do want to come together, and, and in the past we've often had a couple, two different course Sundays that are next to each other, and we, we uh, kind of, you know, offer like, a, like a, a word for the Lord for our community for the year. We, we think a little bit about where we've been and where we're headed as a, as a broader community, and then we also typically have a Sunday where we present to you sort of like the financial outlook for the future and invite you to partner that piece is what we did over the brunch in, in December. So um, that's what Tommy was mentioning. So we, we've already had that conversation. And um, and again, you can catch it online. But it made it so that we only have uh, one course Sunday this year instead of two. And it's a moment for us to come together and to uh, remember who we are. Remember our calling. Remember our collective destiny. And uh, remember Jesus' call on us, the way he's wired us, the, who he's sending us to. And re-upping, like counting the cost and saying yes again, not as an individual, but yes again as a community, you know, with many witnesses. So I just wanted to offer this uh, this text this morning to galvanize us in that, and I'll tell you why. Um, the The text is First Timothy six. You have it on your paper. I'll give you a minute to read it in a second. Earlier this week on Monday, Monday and Tuesday, I was out in the woods um, with like. 50 plus pastors across Tampa Bay praying for two days. Um, it's an annual thing. It's once a year, like all these pastors across Tampa Bay go, go out in the woods and have a two day prayer retreat. We just, I'm not kidding. We sit in a room in a circle facing each other and we pray for two days, two straight days. Um, and, <laughs> and it's actually, it's a remarkable room. I've been doing it for four years now. It's a remarkable room of leaders because it is so, the room is so diverse. Um, uh, multi-generationally, there's like pastors that have been doing it 30, 40 years and pastors that are like you know, in their 20s and just starting. Um, it's w men and women. It's multicultural, multi-ethnic. It's multi kind of denominational, multi like ideological, theological, like it's all over the place. And these people get in a room together and they pray for two days. And there's there's moments like on Monday afternoon, there's moments where like the whole room is like, Let's have a time of like just spontaneous worship and prophetic words and like calling down heaven. And the more kind of like Baptisty pastors are like, all right, we'll give it a try. Okay. We're going to give this a shot. We're going to be, we're all in. And the charismatics are in the, in the room are like, this is it. This is our jam. And the other guys are like, we're going to give this a real try today. And, uh, and then the next day it's like, we're going to just sit in script. We're just going to read the scriptures for like an hour and we're going to be in like contemplative silence and we're going to like cry out like verses of the Bible and the more like kind of calmer Baptists in the room are like, this is our jam. We love this. And the more charismatics in the room are like, we're going to, uh, we're going to give this a try. We're going to give this a try. We're going to do this. And it's just this room where like you're, you, there, there's this massive like love for one another. It's really John 17. Like, I guess God is on the throne for these people to be in the same room and, and doing this together. And um, Tuesday afternoon after lunch, we had this time where we were um, praying for, it was like deliverance. We were praying for like deliverance of demonic strongholds across the city and like interceding against powers and principalities. We had this time where it was like led and set up, like this is what we're doing. This is what we're praying for in this time. So everybody's praying. And after about five or 10 minutes, like the whole room, you like, like just decided, like you, like spontaneously to basically all pray for Ybor City and did that for three hours, like from one until four. It was just praying for Ybor City. And um, again, 60 plus pastors in the room. There's two of us in the room who live in Ybor City. <laughs> 
And we just kind of looked at each other. It was a very complicated environment because um, there's a, like, look, we get it. We've lived, a lot of us have lived in Ybor City for a long time. There are some powers and principalities and strongholds. There's some, some, some serious stuff happening in Ybor City. But we were sitting there like, yeah, there's stuff going on in other places too, y'all. Like, <laughs> like <laughs> there's some other stuff to pray for in the Tampa Bay area. But sort of what I'm, I, again, nobody in the room, like most people in the room are not from kind of the core of Tampa. And, I, I, I was having a really, con- I was in like inner turmoil. <laughs> I was in inner turmoil because it, what it, it felt to me like it was sort of unearthing like some stereotypes of Ybor City and, and we we're sort of leaning into that. And, um, and so I was like having a complicated time internally, but I was trying, I feel like the Lord was really doing something in the room and I was trying to like push down my, how I felt. And I, and I felt like the Lord really was doing like kind of like awakening this whole group of pastors to like laying their lives down for what God is doing in the city. And so we were praying for e- like specifically Ybor City for like an hour and a half. And there's this guy in the room who the whole weekend, and I, and I know him, he's, um, he's more, uh, um, sometimes, he isn't always, sometimes he's more quiet or soft-spoken. He's not the first one to talk. But when he talks, you listen. And he was sort of like, he wasn't praying most of the time. And then there was a time when he literally raised his hand, like he was in a classroom, like asking for permission to talk. This is not a room where you ask for permission to talk. You just talk. But he sort of raised his hand. And again, we're all praying. So half the room has their eyes closed. But we sort of like all started to notice, like this guy's raising his hand. So we said, somebody said, go ahead, man. If you have something to say, you go ahead and say it. And he said, I wondered if I could just say a, a word really briefly. And they said, sure, go ahead, bring it. And he said, I love that we're praying for Ybor City. And I love that we're like identifying idols and strongholds and like wanting good news and love and beauty to be released for people who are like fr- like frequent Ybor City or live in Ybor City. And he said, but I, in the 90s, was in Ybor City every night of the week with sexual relationship after sexual relationship after sexual relationship and was suicidal and was broken, and Jesus had to come to me in a dream because the church never came for me. So he just like looked at that this room and he said, I love that we're praying, but are we actually going to do something this time? <laughs> and he was just sort of like offering it sheepishly, <laughs> like, like we were praying in the 90s and nobody came for me, nobody brought good news to me. Are we actually going to do something? And he, and the room just like like said br- like say more bring more and he just offered this like strong ten minute prophetic word for the room, and this text was part of that like what he delivered to the room, and the week before Tommy had actually brought this text to my attention as a possibility for our morning together and I just felt like let's do it let's spend time and like I just want to like channel his his word for the ten- that group of pastors, and channel it generally for us not just specifically about Ebor City but but this this word about like. He, his word was basically like, are we going to stop letting our, our programs and our buildings and our budgets and our plans and our politics distract us from being the people of God? Are we going to keep you saying words but being distracted by the wrong things? Are we actually going to be like the activated people of God? So I wanted to offer that just as a framing for why we're jumping into 1 Timothy 6. Uh, it, it's just a charge for our whole community to renounce distractions. Remember who you are and reclaim your destiny. Destiny To renounce distractions, remember who you are, and reclaim your destiny. So I, I'm going to let you take some time personally to get into 1 Timothy 6, 3 through 16, to read it on your own. And then I'll let you talk about it with a few people near you. Uh, and then we'll have like a little bit of a, a study in this text this morning. Go ahead and read it on your own. If you'd uh, allow me the grace this morning, I am just going to I am gonna jump in so that we have uh, t- time this morning for a prayer response. It's time underground us as a community, you as leaders and missionaries and communities, it's time to renounce distractions. Remember who you are and reclaim your destiny. 
renounce, remember, and reclaim. I intentionally created an alliteration this week because Brian told me he hates them and uh, tries to avoid them at all costs. <laughs> I tried really hard to make one. These warnings to Timothy actually feel kind of prophetic, don't they, to our time? Like, you read it and you're like, oh, it turns out the Bible is alive and active and maybe relevant to any cultural moment or time. These warnings in 3 through 10, they, they have an unhealthy interest in controversies. I mean, these read it, these could be slogans for social media. You know, Twitter for unhealthy interest in controversy. <laughs> Facebook quarreling about words since 2005 or whatever it was, you know. <laughs> <laughs> envy strife evil suspicions like if you think about the we our communities talked about social trust and ha the the general decline in social trust over the last 15 and 20 years and what that's created is just a blanket p posture of suspicion toward everyone and everything but those the way the, when when there's a gap in information and we make assumptions those assumptions t say more about us than anything else you know Living in evil suspicions, constant friction, a corrupt mind, foolish and harmful desires, the love of money. You know, reading this text actually reminded me of the parable of the four soils. If you remember that, you know, G Jesus shares this parable with the crowd, but then the, he, comes, he comes away, he comes aside with the disciples, and the disciples like, are like, could you tell us more about that? And he actually explains it to the disciples. The first seed falls on the path, and it never takes root at all. The second seed falls on the rock, and because it's on rock, it does like catch and grows a little, but the, it can't take root. The roots can't go deep, so it gets scorched by the sun. It can't, it can't last. It's short-lived. But I was reminded about the difference between the third soil and the fourth soil. He said, the third seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the cares of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. And the fourth seed, falling on good soil, refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop, yielding 30, 60, 100 times <clears throat> what was sown. It's the difference between, like, to, you know, we sometimes if we haven't like read it in a while, it, you you can almost feel like, yeah, the the fourth soil like grows a healthy plant, but that's the third soil. The third soil, which is which is uh, condemned, is not the point, but as a dangerous thing, is a healthy, mature plant that cannot multiply, that cannot yield anything. It's healthy. It grew up. It has a root system. But it was cho its ability to like live beyond itself was choked out by the concerns of this world and the deceitfulness of wealth. These words from Paul to Timothy in this text and to us is drawing us from third soil to fourth soil. It's drawing away from the concerns of this world and the deceitfulness of wealth to be able to yield a crop, to multiply. Isn't Paul basically describing in these, for this first half, this 3 through 11, isn't he describing third soil leaders who have been consumed by the cares of this world and the love of money? And not only are they unable to bear fruit, but they are now endangering the existing crop endangering the existing field. You know, my first job as a kid when I was 13, some of you think me being a farm kid is like a joke that we have around here. I was a legit farm kid. Like, we, <laughs> Brian's like, we got it. Brian's like, we got it. We know. When I was 13, 14, my first job was um, walking entire bean fields to get rid of weeds. So uh, we would you get up at like four or five in the morning, still the dew, do, do, you know, the, the, the field is soaking wet. You're going to soak your clothes, but you want your clothes to get soaked because it cools you off in the afternoon. You don't want to protect from it. You literally put this belt on 
And on one hip, you've got a sickle. And on the other hip, you've got this spray bottle. I didn't know it was in the spray bottle. I think in my adult years, I know now it's Roundup and I probably have cancer. But you have this bottle of Roundup and then you got gloves on. And you literally just walk the rows of entire bean fields looking for weeds. And you got to know the certain kind, there's certain kind of weeds get the sickle, certain kind of weeds you pull, certain kind of weeds you spray. And you've got to know the difference. And you just walk these bean fields. And you try, you don't want to walk like an individual row because it'll take you days. So you try to cover four rows on your left, four rows on your right, eight rows total for one lap. And by the end of the day, your neck hurts worse than your legs because you're going like this all day, all day. Scan and for weeds. Sounds awesome. It's amazing. It's amazing. So good. <laughs> yeah, can we remove that from the recording? I was 16 when I was doing this. I was 16. It was totally legal. Totally legal. Was definitely not paid in cash. Was 100 Paid taxes on all that. Definitely paid taxes on all that. I just remember there was a day, my first, I, I was new to the job, and it was like my first week on the job, and I walked, there was a huge bean field that I, I walked, it took me six hours to walk that field. And I got to the end of the field, and I found, in that whole field, six hours, I found three weeds. Three weeds. And I had, like the previous day, I had done, my, like a standard field, you're pulling weeds on every lap. I walked this whole field six hours, and I found three weeds. I got back, and my boss that like owned the, the whole kind of enterprise, he was like, how was your day? How was that field? And I was like, man, I'm, I'm sorry. I feel like I sort of wasted your money today. Like, I feel bad. That field was clean. He said, you didn't find a single weed. I said, no, I only found three weeds. He was like, he was like then it wasn't clean. <laughs> I said, but you're paying me all this time just to find three weeds. I feel embarrassed. Like, I feel bad for you. And he said, listen, that what I'm paying you to, to get take care of those three weeds, me and my family are saving tenfold what I'm paying you because you took care of those weeds. Tenfold. That's what the risk is. He said, he said worth every penny. So underground, renounce the weeds today. Grab your spray bottle. Grab your sickle. Put on your gloves and wander the fields of your heart, ready to disentangle from the cares of this world and divest from the love of money. Don't get caught up with constant controversy or slander, things that are so normal now. You're weird if you don't. Don't get caught up with constant controversy or slander, constantly assuming the worst or living in friction with others constantly. Not just because it's a horrible way to live, generally. I mean, we know that, right? That's just a bad way to live. But not just because it's a horrible way to live, but because it will choke out your calling. It will make you forget your calling over time. But in the interim, you might remember it, but you won't have any time or imagination or mental or emotional resources to give it. Don't get caught up with the distractions, the cares of this world. And actively divest from the love of money. Live simply. Give generously and radically. And look, I'm just, I'll, I've said it before, I'll say it again. You'll see in the foreground, if you weren't at the brunch, you'll see in the foreground, I think we've got, I think we're one of the best things you can give your money to in the city, the way that we leverage every dollar for kingdom impact across this city. I don't think there's another thing that you can give to that's going to leverage your giving dollars. But if you're not going to give to the underground, that's fine. Give somewhere. Give somewhere. Our main intent for this community is not necessarily just to all give to the, to be kingdom generous people, wherever the Lord is asking you to give it. But that's the antidote to being entangled with money is to live simply and give generously and radically. It's always been a legacy of this community. Let's not lose it. To give generously. To live in such a way in relationship to our resources that's strange and provokes curiosity in the world. Renounce distractions. 
And after going to such great length on these warnings, all these warnings about the times, the leaders that they're in relationship with, the distractions, the love of money, and what that produces, the whole text pivots on those few words. But you, (laughs) man of God... It reminds me so many times in, 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 you know, when Jesus is speaking, when he like describes the way of the world, and he says, but not so with you. Not so with you. The whole text pivots on, but you. Not so with you. You are different. You've been pulled out of Babylon. You are not of this world any longer. You do not submit to its ways, to what's normal for it in any way, but you. And remember, you are a man of God. Remember who you are but you. Even before Paul makes this broader appeal to Timothy, he charges Timothy to remember who he is. But you underground men and women of God flee from all this. Flee from it. And pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Remember, 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 remember. Remember who you are. And maybe more importantly, remember whose you are. Remember to whom you belong. Remember your destiny. Remember your calling. Remember your good confession. And if you're having trouble remembering it, if you've got a little bit of a fuzzy memory, we know because we were witnesses to it. We were witnesses to your calling. We were witnesses to your confession. We are witnesses to your destiny and will remind you when your memory is fuzzy. Remember, remember, remember. It's as if the cares of this world and the love of money weren't necessarily to be battled by a direct campaign, but by first and foremost remembering who you are. That somehow that, that, that amnesia of who we are and to whom we belong and the good confession we made and the calling on our life, that almost the, the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of wealth grips us when we forget and it crowds it further from our memory. And the way back isn't self-help books, but to remember who we are. Remember who we are. And fighting the good fight and enduring the long haul aren't primarily a matter of trying harder, striving in our strength, or having the right psychological tools, but to remember, remember, remember. Back in late 2020, I haven't ever told this story publicly because it was a little complicated and I didn't know how to tell it. <laughs> but back in late 2020, it was like a year into COVID, nine months into COVID. And, um, you know, the world was semi on fire and, uh, the underground's operating, uh, uh, budget that year and all previous years, um, was contingent significantly on revenue streams, the, the facility reservations and events, the media department having clients, the finance department having clients. It was dependent largely on revenue streams that were impacted significantly by COVID. So we were mid-year, and all of our revenue streams were like being impacted heavily by COVID. And when it, revenue streams are impacted, what do you have to do? You have to start thinking, well, we can't spend money anymore. What are we going to not spend money on? We already only spend 10% of what this place is supposed to cost. <laughs> the mall's already mad about it. I'm not going to go ask them like, hey, deuces, we're not going to pay any money. You know, there's, it's like, what do you do? You got to start like laying off personnel or something. But I love these people, and they're, they're, they're busy serving missionaries all over the city. We're in a really tight spot. The other complicated part is that the underground is a um, an umbra- it's an incubator for a lot of local and global international ministries that are on our payroll, so they're being impacted too. Their revenue streams are being a- impacted too. So that so luckily, the government came out with stimulus money. Do you guys remember all this? This this I know it was a long time ago. We repressed most of it. Let me dig it up a little bit, just a little bit for us. So the government came out with small business stimulus money with the intention so that you don't have to lay off your employees during this time if your revenue streams have been impacted. Because if there there was this like mass layoff across the country of workers, it it result in a catastrophic meltdown. So it's like we're gonna we're gonna provide stimulus money not for operations but primarily just to hold on to your staff. 
and you don't have to pay it back as long as you don't lay off any staff. If you lay people off, then you gotta, you'll probably owe some of it back. This was called PPP money. It's part of the CARES Act. Well, again, we weren't just applying for, we weren't just in need of our own underground stimulus money, but we're, we're, there's a bunch of local microchurch, grassroots microchurches and international organizations that are infused with our payroll. And that if they needed PP money, PPP money, they were only going to get it through us. They couldn't apply separately. They had to get it through us because they're entangled with our organization. So they're all asking us, are we going to apply? Are we going to apply? And, and our internal team is like, we got, we, we're, we could really use the help. We need to apply. So we decided to apply. We were due, based on the government's calculations, we were due to receive $120,000, both for us and for these like local microchurches and for international organizations. Everybody's got a lot of hope, like, this is going to be great. It's going to help us to like survive this chaos. We got the check in the bank, and everybody's like, green light, you're approved, you'll see it in a week. We got the check back for $12,000. There was a zero missing. Error. <laughs> A really bad error happened somewhere. So, so I was like, "This is very bad." There's a zero missing, and we we called we called the SBA. It was not our fault. It, we called the SBA. We were like, "Did you guys mess with that? That like, did you guys miss a zero in there?" They're like, "We're it's got nothing to do with us. We can't fix it. It's a done deal. Once the money's in your account, there's nothing you can do." I called the local, like the Tampa SBA office. They're like, "Guys, sorry, nothing we can do." I called the county SBA office. They're like, sorry guys, once it's in, nothing we can do. I called the state SBA office. Sorry guys, there's nothing we can do to fix it. We're so sorry. There's no recourse here. I called the national SBA office. Sorry guys, there's no recourse. It's like really terrible. There's nothing we can do. But you're welcome for the $12,000. You could say thank you, you know. You know? So I was like, like told, and, and externally, all these other organizations that are depending on this, they're like, hey, is everything going well? And we're like, yep, it's fine. It's totally fine. No worries. <laughs> continue as usual <laughs> and internally we're just like we're going to fix it we're going to find a way to fix this like we're not going to give up on this we called lawyers we called attorneys we called i talked to mark rubio <laughs> i'm like mark <laughs> i don't know who else to call man they like no they're like we don't know how to fix you got the money it's in your account it's a done deal once the money's in your account it's a done deal there's no recourse we just felt like we were dealing with this for four months Phone calls. No, this wasn't like one week having all these phone calls. It's four months. And all along, we were just telling all the other organizations, everything's fine. Everything's fine. And toward the end of that four months, I was like, I don't know if it's going to be fine. I think we have to start making serious financial decisions. Through a weird string of events, I got on the phone with uh, uh, somebody a little bit like a, like a local VP of a Bank of America branch, which is our bank. And the banks involved too. Bank of America, I called their the Tampa Bank of America. It's terrible. Never call them. And they they were like they were like we can't fix it. We're not going to help you. Blah blah. blah. So I, then I talked to the regional Bank of America, the national, same thing, all the way up. Where we can't help you, we can't help you. And I got on the phone with this random person with Bank of America in the Midwest, and I was like, here's the situation. I don't know if you can help. And he basically said he emailed me. He got off the phone and he emailed me and he said, look, um, there's literally nothing you can do. Your only hope. And try this, and once you've tried it, give up. Stop wasting time. We'd sunk a lot of time into this. He was like, give up. Stop. He said, the, one, the last thing you can do is you can send an email to this guy named Brian. Here's his email. And he'll, and he'll if, if anybody can do anything, it's him. And I, and I emailed back, and I said, who's this Brian guy? It's the CEO of Bank of America. The national CEO of Brian, I think his last name was Moynihan. Like I, I, I YouTubed him, and he's like on CNN every week or something. Like C-SPAN, like whatever. I'm like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna send an email to this guy. What are you talking about? He doesn't even look at his email. We all know he doesn't look at his email. He's like, well, it's your last chance. If you want to do anything else, you just have to email this guy. So I'm like, oh gosh. So I, st so I have, I like almost no hope at that point. I just wrote this super long email, like. Please, like, here's the situation. Please help. Here's who we are. Here's how we operate. I don't know whose mistake it was. I'm so sorry. I heard you're the last one. This super long email. <laughs> and I was about to click send, and I just felt this nudge from the Lord, like, demand it. And this, and I just looked at the email, and the email, the email was just so like begging you, like, please, please. Brian Moynihan with Bank of America, please help us 
so long and kind of like groveling and like, I don't know, we sure hope you can help or whatever. I just felt this nudge, like just demand it. And I just deleted the email and I just wrote like one paragraph, Matt, like three or four sentences that was basically like, I almost printed it this morning, uh, like the email. <laughs> I almost printed it this morning. It basically just said, look, I'm the executive director of this organization. We, we incubate and serve grassroots ministries across the city. We've got people who are serving like in, in areas of like addiction, human trafficking, incarceration. And then we've got like grassroots house churches all over the city. Something got messed up. We, we needed 120. We got 12. I don't know who did it. You're the only one who can help. And then at the last couple of lines, I just was very clear to say, if you don't do this, we're going to be fine. You're not saving anybody. I'm not asking you to save us. And you're not saving anybody. Because I know to whom we belong. But I know to whom we belong, and I also know that you belong to him too. So I have to, act, I have to at least ask you if you can do something about this. Sent it. Guys, in six hours, we had $108,000 coming to our account. On a Monday morning. <laughs> I... <laughs> I got like an email from his assistant that basically said like is there, again really quick quick response too hey Brian saw your email he's going to deal with this right away he's going to go to the SBA office and deal with this right away he, see, he looked like he was emotional reading your email he has some experience with addiction it's like you just, just you just have no idea. Like this little line, you just have no idea what's going to happen. And he just operates on it. This guy probably doesn't even check his email half the time. <clears throat> I was dealing with that whole situation, four months of that situation, and then writing a big long email. And for four months and writing that email, I was forgetting who I was and to whom I and all of us and every square foot in the land belongs. That Bank of America situation is what you would maybe call a miracle. And we've so often kind of got it backwards that we normalize life without miracles, <laughs> like life in the natural. That's normal. That's reality. We call that reality. And then we see little miracles we see little supernatural things happen and we interpret it as like we've stepped briefly out of reality to witness this very exceptional special unique thing that's happened and now we'll return back to reality we'll return back to our expectations all that kind of stuff and we look at supernatural occurrences as exceptional but if we remember who we are and to whom we belong, and the good confession that we've made, and the calling that he has for us. It's the other way around. I think, I think our reality, our expectations, our worldview is for the supernatural. And we walk not in, a, not in a, some weird narcissistic spiritual authority of our own, but we walk in authority and power because of whom we're rooted in because of whom we're in union with. Underground, remember who you are this year. Renounce the distractions and remember who you are. Walk in the neighborhood not asking for travel mercies, but for heaven to come down in the neighborhood. In every living room, in every marriage, for heaven to come down. In every community center, every corner, Walk in your office building, not walking on eggshells and cautious and timid, but bold and ready. Ready, ready, ready. And expectant. Walk in the halls of your school, expectant that the divine is going to collide in those hallways. It's time to renounce distractions, to remember who we are, and to reclaim our destiny as his.
If Emily would come up, I just want to take the last moment together as a community reclaiming that destiny. He says, take hold, take hold, take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. I just want to take a moment as a community reclaiming our kingdom destiny to take hold of that eternal life to which we were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you this morning to take hold of what you've already received. To close your hands around what's already true. To grasp what's already been given. To embrace what's already been secured. It's not to strive or stretch out for something that isn't already given, but something that's already sitting in your hand and you just have to take hold of it. To take hold. I charge us this morning to reclaim, to renounce, remember, and to finally reclaim, to take hold of that eternal life to which we were called.